Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar for the ACCEE State Transportation Electrification Scorecard. Um, today, we will be discussing the results and findings from our report, which we are releasing today. My name is Shruti Vaidinathan. I'm the Transportation Program Director at ACCEE, a co-author of this report, and I will also be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Your screen is cust completely customizable, and each area can be minimized or maximized for easier viewing in the upper right-hand corner of each box. If you're unable to see the presenter or slides, please click through the widgets at the bottom. <clears throat> Feel free to submit questions to our panelists anytime throughout the hour by using the Q&A engagement tool that appears on your screen and as a widget at the bottom. You'll see several other helpful widgets available, including speaker bios and a resource list to download materials from today's podcast. There's also a help widget for audio and webcam troubleshooting. We will prioritize questions from members of the press. So if you are a member of the press, please include a note about your outlet when you submit your question. And finally, a recording of this webinar will be made available and all participants will receive the link within a few days. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel of speakers. They are Commissioner Patty Monahan from the California Energy Commission, Zurai Hagos, Deputy Director, Office of Markets and Innovation with the New York State Department of Public Service. Shoshana Liu, Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Transportation. And Brian Howard, State Policy Director with ACEEE and lead author of the State Transportation Electrification Scorecard. Before I turn our mic over to our first speaker, I wanna take a moment to introduce ACEEE's transportation research and provide some background for the report we're releasing today. For those of you not familiar with our organization, ACEEE is a nonprofit that acts as a catalyst to advance energy efficiency policies, programs, technologies, investments, and behaviors. Transportation has now surpassed the electricity sector as the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. To address the growing urgency of the climate crisis, ACEEE conducts research on policies to scale up the adoption of efficient vehicle technologies while also promoting the creation of sustainable, low-carbon passenger and freight transportation systems. We advocate for a set of policy measures to achieve ambitious reductions in transportation-related energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, while also improving livability, health, and access to efficient transportation for all. Electrified transportation is increasingly considered a key step to reducing transportation-related emissions. ACEEE supports the deployment of EVs in a way that maximize both social and environmental benefits. For instance, we support the use of electric transit options in historically marginalized communities as a means of improving access to efficient, low-carbon transportation options, reducing health impacts from transportation-related pollution, and addressing greenhouse gas emissions. The Transportation Electrification Scorecard is reflective of that approach. Our report highlights what state actors specifically are doing to create a supportive policy environment to assist the transition towards electrified personal and shared passenger vehicles, freight vehicle fleets, and transit and school buses in an effort to ensure equitable access to the benefits of transportation electrification. States are at varying stages in their transportation electrification journeys. Electric vehicles make up just 2% of the American vehicle market, and many are still grappling with the best ways to encourage their relative their, their uptake in a relatively nascent market. But before I give too much away, I'm gonna turn it over to our lead author, Brian Howard, who is our state policy director here at ACEEE to provide an overview of the scorecard results and main takeaways. Brian, over to you. Thank you, Shruti, for the introduction and thank you uh, to those who are joining us virtually. On behalf of the research team who worked on the scorecard, thank you for joining us today to hear uh, an overview of key findings of the ACEEE State Transportation Electrification Scorecard. ACEEE has included transportation topics in our various scorecards, and we are excited to have the opportunity to provide a focused look at state actions to electrify transportation. Since this is the first scorecard of its kind, I wanted to share some details and on the goals and parameters of the scorecard before we dive too deep into the details. State policy is a critical component for transportation electrification. The majority of policy governing the utility sector occurs at the state level, which is a critical component of transportation electrification. In addition, the last four years have shown that states can fill a void in federal leadership while serving as a model for other uh, levels of government. Building on the important research of our peers, the scorecard provides a comprehensive benchmark of policies to promote uh, transportation electrification for all states. This evaluation can demonstrate how EV-specific policies work with the utility and transportation sectors to maximize GHG reductions 
while ramping up EV deployment of light and heavy duty vehicles. The scorecard is intended to help decision makers and other stakeholders to identify and scale up the most promising policies related to EVs and EV charging infrastructure. On a 100 point scale, the scorecard looks at state actions addressing passenger vehicles or light duty and commercial vehicles, you know, commonly used or commonly referred to as heavy duty vehicles across the legislative, executive and public utility commissions. It is divided into six categories as seen on the screen. While we collected and provided information provide our, on programs and details of all 50 states in the District of Columbia, we only ranked the top 20 states. States in the bottom 20 scored 15 points or lower, and many achieved few or no points in several categories. Our ranking of the state is highlighted in this slide. California is ranked first in the scorecard, earning 91 points out of a possible 100. New York came in second with 63.5, followed by other leaders on as shown on the image. While a number of states are making continued progress to expand EVs and charging infrastructure, only five states in the District of Columbia scored more than half of the points available in the scorecard. We have the privilege of hearing from some leading states, so I don't wanna steal their thunder, but I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge some of the other regional leadership shown by states. In the Midwest, Minnesota ranks 12th overall in the scorecard. Clear guidelines from the Public Utility Commission related to uh, utility investment in EV charging infrastructure has resulted in over 23 million in funding uh, towards EV infrastructure and another 1.8 proposed, more than 1.8 proposed. The state has also seg uh, issued regulations to adopt California's light duty uh, emission vehicles program, which would require electrical manufa or manufacturers, pardon me, uh, to offer a certain number of zero emission vehicles in the state. In the Southeast, uh, Virginia ranks 16th overall and is making important headway on electrifying transportation. For example, the Virginia Clean Tran uh, Transportation Voucher Program offers up to 100% of the cost of replacing eligible transit buses. The state is also providing time varying rates um, for level two EV chargers. Across the category of the scorecard, we found many strategies were well employed by states. States are engaged in comprehensive planning efforts to grow the share of EVs and EV chargers. This can take place uh, as part of a state energy plan as in New Jersey, standalone efforts like the state uh, of Utah electric vehicle master plan, or can, or can happen in cooperation like the multi-state zero emission vehicles action plan. States, uh, state incentives like the Maryland Clean Fuels Infrastructure Program offers grants for the purchase of heavy duty uh, electric vehicles. States are using uh, funding through the Federal Transit Administration's low or no grant program towards the purchase of EV transit buses. Utilities like the Georgia uh, Power Time of Use uh, Plug-in Electric Vehicle Program are offering lower rates for electric, uh, or lower electric rates at preferred time of charging. Efforts like the PEPCO Transportation Electrification Plan in Washington, D.C. designate funding through utility programs to spur uh, EV adoption uh, in targeted low-income areas in the district. The data collected and evaluated by our research team helped us draw out some important discoveries as part of the process. Our full report includes uh, included in the executive summary and the report uh, have some key considerations, but I did want to flag a few. As I already mentioned, uh, only five states in the District of Columbia scored more than half of the points available in the scorecard. Um, as Shruti mentioned, we think this means that all states can improve their policies and that many states are still in the formational period of their uh, foundational work with, with relation to transportation electrification. It's also clear that uh, states have an array of choices that they can make to improve their standing within policy uh, or within the policy landscape of transportation electrification. Equity is an area that states are still grappling with and even states uh, with a proactive track record in this area um, can and need to do more to advance access and benefits of electrification to all communities. While states have had uh, the ability to move at their own pace, we've seen collaborative efforts like the zero emission, medium and heavy duty uh, vehicle action plan signed by 15 governors and the mayor of DC as, as an ability to uh, be a catalyst to move uh, the policy landscape uh, further and faster. Our evaluation of current state policies also gave us a perspective of how to move um, 
uh, transportation electrification forward. In the states uh, that are still in the formational process, um, the report identifies a series of recommendations we think are actionable and impactful. They are briefly summarized here, and we have spoken about some of them already, but I can't over or overstate the importance of having clear, a clearly articulated plan to guide decision-making for states and track progress around transportation electrification. Another component that is critical to success in this policy is direct encouragement of utility and third-party EV investment in EV charging infrastructure. Um, that includes exempting third-party EV uh, charging providers from being defined as a public utility, which the report goes into greater detail about. For states that are further along in their policy development process, we include a separate set of recommendations which are summarized here and in the full report. States can build on the foundation of success by taking steps such as establishing on the hood incentives for the purchase of light duty vehicles and uh, other funding incentives for heavy duty electric vehicles and by establishing binding targets for those, vehicle, for those class of vehicles. Um, I would also encourage folks to take a look at the, the executive summary and um, the full uh, report for um, some more specific state or section uh, details uh, on our website. I'm excited to hear from our other panelists, so I want to pass the mic um, over to Patty uh, to allow her to, to start with her comments. And thank you for the time you've been here. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, my name is Patty Monahan. I'm a commissioner at the California Energy Commission. And uh, it's wonderful to see this report by AC Tripoli. And of course, <laughs> I'm really happy that California is leading the pack. Uh, and I wanted to just take a step back and look at the history of California's commitment to zero emission transportation. So the first time California passed a zero emission vehicle policy was in 1990. So the state has been signaling to the auto industry for th you know, over 30 years that they need to electrify. And now what we're seeing is progress, not just in California, of course, but across the United States and across the globe. And it, this really does need to be a global transition in order to ensure that we can meet our global targets for reducing carbon pollution and, uh, and actually getting some of the benefits from electric transportation that are just superior to internal combustion engines. In California, Governor Newsom last year uh, issued an executive order that raised the bar globally. And what he said was that we need to electrify everything on the transportation system, and we need to do it as soon as possible. So it's not just about passenger cars, but uh, trucks as well. So the governor has issued this goal of having 100% of in-state sales of new passenger cars and trucks to be zero emission by 2035, 100% of uh, all operations for so-called drage trucks, which are the trucks that move between like ports and distribution centers and places where, you know, people are often disproportionately burdened by diesel pollution, that those all need to be zero emission by 2035 or feasible. And that 100% um, of off-road vehicles and equipment to be zero emission were feasible as well. So the governor is setting very robust targets for us in the state. And we uh, are working, the agencies that are, that are part of his administration are working hard to make sure that we can meet those goals. So as I said, I'm in the Energy Commission. We're working really very closely with our counterparts at the Air Resources Board and also at the Public Utilities Commission to make sure that we have the right policies in place to reach the goals of the governor's executive order. And I wanna just um, really quickly say our theory of change. Um, basically, we, we think that we need to overcome the three Cs in order to reach full commercialization of uh, electric vehicles. And the three C's are cost, convenience, and consumer awareness. And I'm gonna go really quickly through those. I know we have a, a robust set of speakers. So the first one is, is cost. We need to like scale up the market to drive down prices. And as I said, this is happening. It's happening globally. And uh, you know, we're, so through regulations, through incentives, we're trying to really build up the market of electric vehicles. The second big obstacle is convenience, and that is uh, building out a ZEV infrastructure, an infrastructure for zero emission vehicles that is going to be robust enough to meet all of our needs. 
And we think that we'll need both fuel cell electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles to meet that uh, deep, deep, you know, the goal of having 100% of vehicles being electric. So this is relies on some investment by the state. The California Energy Commission is the lead for building out that infrastructure, the utilities, the private sector. What we're trying to do is signal to the private sector that this market is going to be, um, you're going to make money <laughs> by electrifying transportation. And we're just trying to jumpstart that, those investments with public dollars. The last C is consumer awareness. And that's what we're also working on making sure that consumers are aware that these vehicles exist and understand all the benefits that, that they can provide. So you should check out Veloz, V-E-L-O-Z, to see some of the cool advertisements that we've done with Arnold Schwarzenegger and other luminaries, um, really trying to just get the word out. So uh, with that, I'll just close up. Thank you again for having me, and thanks again for issuing this report. It really is, it really is wonderful and gives a roadmap for other states to, to move forward on transportation electrification. Thank you so much, Commissioner Monahan, for that great overview of California's leadership on transportation electrification. And uh, to see uh, how aggressive some of the targets that California has implemented um, are uh, for the future. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're now going to turn to Zarai Hagos from the New York State Department of Public Service to share a few remarks on New York's transportation electrification efforts. Zarai is the Deputy Director of the Office of Markets and Innovation at the New York State Department of Public Service, where he leads the clean energy, wholesale market issues, utility business model, and transportation staff sections. Uh, prior to his appointment to the DPS, Mr. Agos was the Senior Director of Business Development at Uplight, form formerly named Tendril, where he helped grow a new distributed energy resources platform called Orchestrated Energy. Uh, Zarai, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Shruti. Um, so, uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, my name is Zarai Hagos, and I'm here in snowy New York today. Uh, I'm very excited to speak to uh, all of you about uh, what New York's up to regarding transportation electrification. Um, and it is a really busy time here in New York right now uh, with our recently um, legislatively established greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals of 40%. Um, reduction by 2030 and uh, net zero economy wide uh, by 2050. Um, you know, and, and, and in particular, given how um, you know New York's electric sector is um, generally less carbon intensive than the rest of the country, um, uh, we have to be um, especially uh, 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 responsive to um, uh, decarbonizing the transportation sector here. Um, we've set some really aggressive near-term goals um, uh, regarding the transportation sector, which include um, reaching 850,000 zero emissions vehicles by 2025. And that's really been um, the uh, guiding star for our near-term um, policy implementations. Um, I think Commissioner Monahan's um, articulation of the three C's uh, seem to resonate with a lot of the programs that we've put in place to to achieve our near-term goals and get, put us in a position to get to that longer-term um, net zero economy. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, focusing in on the individual consumer and, uh, and enabling them to, um, in a cost-effective manner, make a transition from their traditional ICE vehicle to an electric vehicle. Um, we have uh, $2,000 rebates in place for EV drivers. Um, we've also, um, in the last, uh, I'd say, two years, ensured that every uh, every driver in the state has access to a special time of use rate that's designed for electric vehicle drivers. Um, the adoption of time of use rates has been slow. Generally, um, anywhere, it's been up to about 5% of drivers elect to transition over to a EV time of use rate. And you know, I think part of that is about consumer awareness and part of that is about um, convenience. And so um, you know, many of our utilities also offer managed charging programs that are an alternative to just a plain time of use rate that may have some form of automation or um, you know, some, some simplifying um, means for uh, for shifting when they charge. And um, as a matter of statewide policy, um, we directed every investor-owned utility to file proposals for managed charging programs, which happened last December. 
and we're in the process of reviewing that um, to to in fact ensure that every driver has an alternative to time of use rates here in New York State. Um, you know, uh, on the public charging front, um, this is, uh, I think, a really critical piece that the utilities can help the industry make progress with, and they're uniquely, I think, positioned to support the industry. Um, we've had a, uh, a per-plug uh, incentive in place for um, folks that own fast charging stations. This is an annual payment that declines over time um, to offset the uh, the cost of purchasing electricity. Um, you know, the getting too not getting too far into rate design. Um, the demand charges that most DC fast charging stations are subject to can make the um, the economics of developing a charging station challenging early on. And so, um, we've created a program that. Um, provides a declining um, annual payment uh, that helps address uh, that challenge, um, particularly right now where driving, um, the amount of cars on the road is still relatively small. Um, on, on top of that, uh, this past July, uh, the commission adopted a $700 million EV make ready program to address the upfront costs associated with building public charging stations. Um, and the kind of overarching goal of that uh, program is to make sure that there are um, ample um, supply of um, publicly accessible charging stations that use open technology. Um, and what, you know, the way we, um, th that, that goal is reflected is um, a 90% um, incentive payment uh, for the eligible make ready costs um, for publicly accessible stations that use non proprietary plug types and then a lower 50% incentive level for other types of stations with access restrictions and proprietary plug types. And, you know, equity is also a, a critical component of our climate policy. Um, we require up to 40% of our um, climate spending to be dedicated towards um, disadvantaged communities. And so uh, 206 million of our, um, of our July um, program uh, is set aside for programs that establish that uh, support disadvantaged communities. Um, that includes 20% of the incentive budgets with a higher 100% payment. Um, we're also in the process of launching um, right now an $85 million prize competition um, for uh, to solicit ideas um, and implement them um, to reduce emissions um, in, in communities that are impacted by transportation uh, emissions and uh, also expand access to electric mobility solutions for um, for our, uh, our communities that are on the front lines. Um, we have a number of medium and heavy duty programs, but I think um, you know we can get into some of that during the Q and A section um, of this discussion. So um, that's all to say that we just you know we we're excited about the programs we've we've been able to bring to drivers here in New York State, and we have a lot of work remaining to um, to get us to that broader. Um, 2030 and 2050 goal that the uh, the legislature set for us. So um, with that, um, I'll, I'll close. Thank you so much, Zurai. It's great to hear about the width and breadth of um, EV programs that New York State is investing in. Um, so let's move on to our next speaker. Um, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Shoshana Liu, the executive director for the Colorado Department of Transportation. Uh, director Liu was appointed as the executive director for the Colorado Department of Transportation in December 2018. Um, she's charged with leading the department in planning for and addressing Colorado's transportation needs and overseeing 3,000 employees statewide in an annual budget this year of approximately $2 billion. Um, prior to coming to Colorado, she served as the chief, chief operating officer for the Rhode Island Department of Transportation. She was also the chief financial officer and assistant secretary for budget and programs for the U.S. Department of Transportation, as well as a deputy assistant secretary for transportation policy at USDOT. Um, Shoshana, I will turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Hey, Dad, thank you so much for the introduction and for having me today. It's really a pleasure to be able to talk about the exciting work that so many of us are doing. Um, to advance electrification at this really pivotal time for the market. But this is an exciting time in Colorado uh, as we just completed our climate roadmap, um, which establishes the, state, the state's science-based climate targets of 26% um, emissions reductions by 2025, 50% by 2030, and 90% by 2050 uh, relative to 2005 levels. 
And this was is, is implementing a legislative target uh, and building on all of the collective actions that we have done until now and will continue to do across the state. And, you know, I, I think we're really at a pivot point as we think about the role that transportation plays. I mean, we've made tremendous progress in the utility sector you know, with virtually all of the utilities in the state um, making significant strides in uh, clean energy, providing the power to make, uh, make it such that electric vehicles are um, really optimizing their benefits um, moving forward. And the role that we play at CDOT, I, I think is, is notable because part of the challenge uh, at the juncture we are at now is making sure the transportation departments as well as the sort of traditional players in the clean energy space are part of the solution as we think through our climate goals. And you know, within CDOT, there are sort of three areas that we are focused on working closely with our peer agencies, the State Energy Office and the Department of Public Health and the Environment. But first and foremost, there's the conversation that we're all having today about how to increase um, efficiency and availability of mobile sources. You know, the, Colorado was the first state in uh, over a decade to adopt dev regulations, the first ever uh, in the country to adopt them with these sort of buy-in of the auto industry uh, virtually universally. And, you know, they're, and signing on to the interstate MOU on medium and heavy duty uh, trucks has been a big focus of ours since then. You know, all, all of that, though, has to be integrated into two other areas, which are really you know, even more so within our jurisdiction at CDOT, the, primarily the, thinking through the interface with the infrastructure and how we make sure that we sort of build that, not just the charging network, but really our whole conversation about infrastructure development in a way that's integrated. Um, and then the, the complicated but critical uh, juncture of addressing behavior change by increasing optionality for travelers across modes. So with respect to infrastructure, you know, we are obviously working closely with other agencies in the state on the fast charging network and developing our electric vehicle corridors, but we're also working to sort of further integrate the work that we are doing to build out traditional infrastructure projects in a way that you know, more organically integrates um, clean transportation considerations, including providing the resources for electrification. I think with respect to behavior change elements, and we've heard about this some from our peer states, there, you know, there's a lot that we can do on everything from education, which is a big focus for us. And you know, what, what, one of the real benefits of adopting ZEV for us was the, you know, the, the, the ability to kind of elevate the profile of the state and the awareness of electric vehicle options but also making sure that the incentives that we have, um, like our electric vehicle um, tax credit, are no known and easy to access for citizens. And you know, one of the significant um, achievements in the last couple of months is that General Motors was the first company in some time, other, and the first other than Nissan, to adopt the assignability provisions in our tax credit, basically making it easier for consumers to access the benefits of our state tax incentive at the point of sale. Um, and this was, uh, this was a partnership that was forged because of the work that we had done leading up to ZEV. Yeah, there are also other um, a aspects that we are working on, you know, re really, really in integrated with the kind of transportation process. You know, the Transportation Commission in Colorado was not traditionally a player in, in the conversations around electrification. And in the last year or so, it has really become part of the dialogue about how we um, in, in, integrate more consumer choice and electrification um, options into our state system. So you know, I think the uh, bottom line for us is a taking a whole of government approach to electrification and the way that we work together to make this a focus for the state has been really instrumental to Colorado over the last uh, two years in the Polish administration. And uh, with that, it looks like we're about a time, so perhaps we should move to questions and answers. Thank you so much, Director Liu, and thank you uh, to all our speakers for taking the time to join us today. Um, so we have about uh, 20 minutes for a question and answer, uh, uh, for a question and answer section. Um, if you have a question, just a, a reminder that you can submit it via the Q&A engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as a reminder, we ask that if you are a member of the press that you flag your outlet for us when you submit your question. Um, so we've received a number of uh, really great questions, and I'm hoping that all of our um, speakers can be seen on the screen to be able to answer um, anything that I pose to them. Um, Brian, uh, there are a couple of questions for you with regards to specific details on, um, on the uh, transportation electrification scorecard. One of um, 
the things that um, folks have asked repeatedly as you have been presenting your results is how does the report sort of factor into the fact that to really achieve a zero emission transportation system, we need utility policies that are focused on cleaning up state grids. Can you talk a little bit about how we've been, uh, how you have uh, integrated that into the analysis? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I certainly agree with uh, commenters who uh, get to the fundamental question that if we need, uh, if we want clean transportation, we need to have a clean grid to be part of that. So in uh, a section uh, on, or in the um, grid optimization section of the scorecard, we do have a, a pretty deep analysis that looking at what states have been doing to um, uh, provide overall decarbonization efforts along with um, interim targets. So we do provide some analysis and evaluation of where states are in that process and then how they're doing in that area. But um, you know, we certainly agree that uh, we're going to need to uh, deploy broader clean energy technologies as well as energy efficiency as, a, as an element of this if we're going to reach the overall uh, emissions goals um, and uh, public health and other uh, co-benefits of those policies. Um, and in terms of what the report found, um, were there any specific policies uh, that your research showed had more impact than others on kickstarting EV development? And then conversely, were there policies that you expected to see out there that you didn't see as frequently um, in uh, our ratings? Yeah, so the report does uh, try to wait, um, you know, or, or based on some of the research of our peers, uh, looking at analyses in terms of what was aiding deployment. We tended to find, uh, or we, te we found that, uh, based on the, the research, existing research, that incentives and, and binding targets were um, really important signals to be able to really move um, electric vehicles uh, into the broader marketplace. So whether that's incentives for um, you know passenger vehicles or, or you know heavy duty vehicles, or having specific targets based on that, similar to what California has established with their their light duty program that's been extended to you know I think about 13 states at this point, with two or three more considering uh, regulations. Um, with regards to states that uh, or state action that I was surprised about. Um, my background is, is more specifically in buildings, so that's obviously where some of my head goes. Um, I was really surprised about the lack of overall statewide policies about um, EV-ready codes or EV-supportive codes or, or you know, building that capacity out, um, specifically with multifamily buildings. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to ensure that um, we're getting access and benefits to those parties. I was a little bit surprised, um, just given that based on our findings, um, there were five statewide kind of codes in some capacity or had some kind of eligibility. And then a number of states, you know, like Colorado has been, uh, you know, is a home rule state, so has some some opportunities to, to do some smaller scale issues. And we did score and evaluate a number of states like Colorado, you know, New York has, you know, the city has a, has a specific code requirement. You know, we provided some partial credit for municipalities that were taking some leadership in that area, but I was very surprised um, about building codes and, and where, the status of that is. Um, moving on to some broader questions from our panel, um, we've had a lot of questions about how your states are sort of thinking through um, EV equity to ensure that everyone benefits from the transition to transportation electrification. Zura, I know you sort of mentioned um, in more detail some of the utility focused programs that New York has um, embarked on, but it'd be great to hear from uh, Director Liu and Commissioner Monahan about what California and Colorado are doing on, in that respect. Commissioner Monahan, would you like to go first? Commissioner, can you hear us? I'm sorry, I had a little glitch in my. Um, I, I'm sorry, I turned off some programs because I think I was taking too much bandwidth. Can you repeat the question? Because I couldn't hear it. Sure. Are you yeah, hearing so me okay? I, I turned yes. off a lot of things, but I'm hoping now the bandwidth is good. We can hear you um, just fine. So I just wanted to uh, dive a little bit deeper into what um, Colorado and California have been doing on the equity front to make sure that the um, benefit to transportation is not being extended to all. Well, so we um, at the there's multiple programs we're doing to support equity. Uh, one is that we provide rebates, a clean cars for all program for used vehicles. And we're really trying to reach consumers that can't afford to buy a new vehicle, but are looking into the used vehicle fleet for their for their vehicle. And that's an important uh, for lower income families. We have an income cap so that it really is just targeted to people who, who need extra support. 
On the charging infrastructure side, so we have a program, uh, about $100 million a year that we give out for plane transportation. Half of that money has to support low income or disadvantaged communities. So we're really setting the bar high in terms of <clears throat> making sure that our investments support people who you know, live in apartment buildings who can't get easy access to, at, at their home for charging. So we're trying to make it very easy for them to either get uh, charging near their home where we can, we're trying innovative solutions in uh, multifamily dwellings. And this is particularly a challenge. It's not uh, for, new, for new buildings, we have standards, but for existing buildings where most people, you know, that's most of our buildings, um, it's much harder to install charging retroactively. So we're, but we are exploring creative solutions on, on that side as well. <clears throat> and I do believe that because we, we, we have so much political will in the state to ensure that this is a transition that benefits everybody. We're, we're spending a lot of our time and money just on the, uh, you know, the segment of society, uh, the segment of our population that is low income and disadvantaged. Uh, uh, th thank you. And first, I would echo the importance of building the sort of secondary market for used electric vehicles as increasing equity, because you know, given the dynamics of how Vehicle ownership typically works. That, that, that is often how you, uh, you know, increase the availability and lower the price point. I think in terms of specific policies that we are looking at right now and implementing right now, the one I, I mentioned the assignability provision in our text uh, credit, and just to dig in for a moment on why that's important, particularly for equity, being able to accrue the benefit of the tax incentives at the point of sale it was particularly important for folks you know, who are potentially coming to the table with the need to agree that benefit immediately rather than carrying the cost until tax season. So being a, you know, increasing the number of affordable vehicle manufacturers who, you know, help, help us make use of that provision in our um, tax program, you know, is one extraordinarily important measure. But I think in terms of the charging network, I would touch for a moment on some of the considerations that we have given the magnitude of our rural communities and the sort of scope of the state system and making sure that we can have electrification be something that's accessible for folks across the state is very dependent on having charging availability between the population centers because you know, we, like California and other places, have vast um, spatial um, gaps between the places where population centers. So making sure that we build out our charging network in a way that accommodates the sort of small and mid-sized communities between the places where it will likely take off on its own in a more commercial sense is going to be a big um, piece of the kind of equitable infrastructure component for us. And two, two other things I would just touch on quickly is one, the importance of the medium and heavy duty conversation for equity in Colorado. You know, particularly given sort of the dynamics of where our freight, um, our freight infrastructure is centered, th there's a lot of sort of heavy trucking traffic in low income and um, disproportionately impacted communities, you know, such as North Denver is an area where a lot of sort of the commercial transportation takes place. So as we think about uh, wh where to sort of double down on increasing the availability of you know, technologies that support clean trucking, we are taking a very sort of place-based approach to thinking about how we do emissions reductions in, the air in some of those areas that are you're really more impacted by you know, highways and other parts of the state. And you know, finally, I would just note, this is a little bit less about electrification specifically, but very pertinent to our transportation conversation writ large, is we're taking you know, a very different approach to how we talk about the impacts of transportation on air quality in communities. And you know, traditionally, there had been some challenges, you know, frankly, at the ag agency that I run in terms of how we had measured the greenhouse gas impacts of transportation projects and looking at factors like induced demand and how it affects communities. And we're taking a much more proactive approach to measuring you know, everything from you know, fine particulate matter to NOx emissions in, at the front end when we look at transportation impacts and NEPA, you know, because knowledge is sort of power in terms of being able to have a serious conversation about how we deal with the equity impacts of the transportation system. And that you know, has ripple effects to electrification because it all sort of fits together as one network. And that's a great point, Director Liu. I think a number of our uh, viewers are sort of interested in, in trying to better understand how to evaluate equity-related outcomes. So I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, just as a follow-up question um, that I have seen um, asked uh, in our Q&A box, 
um, a, a number of our viewers want to know how your states and organizations are sort of incorporating the communities that are mo most disadvantaged by transportation pollution um, or access to um, transportation options in your planning process for transportation electrification more broadly. Um, Zarai, maybe we can start with you. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a, a great question. Um, it's really tough, you know, um, some of these equity issues, uh, particularly since the private market is really responding first in the light duty space where vehicle ownership is generally lower. That's certainly the case here in New York um, within uh, lower income communities. Uh, I mentioned the um, well, so first of all, our broader climate policy in New York um, forms what's called the climate justice working group. So as we implement policies that um, are going to you know, create incentives or requirements to get to those longer term greenhouse gas reduction goals, this working group is really going to um, you know, first of all, define what a disadvantaged community is, because there's a lot of, um, you know, different, uh, I guess, interpretations of how that might be defined right now. Um, and so, you know, they are they are uh, going to be the ones making that definition and making sure that um, um, the broader implementation, um, uh, we're all we're all kind of working um, together uh, against the same goal and and and, and measured against the same goals. Um, but uh, I'd say for uh, the programs that we have in place now, I mentioned the prize competition in my opening remarks, um, where we are um, now in the process of of uh, soliciting, um, you know, uh, ideas that will be funded to lower emissions and increase access within um, uh, low income and environmental justice communities, which is the definition that um, exists within our um, commission programs right now. And um, you know, a key part of the evaluation criteria for any proposal we receive will be what is the level of in, uh, community engagement. So every proposer is going to have to demonstrate, I've been working with the community, I've been working with these community-based organizations and the ones that have uh, a greater, um, um, can, can demonstrate a greater amount of, um, of, of cooperation will be, um, you know, will be uh, evaluated more, um, more favorably. Um, and we're also, um, you know, uh, in the process of, of uh, right now um, pr pr uh, getting uh, an infrastructure in place to provide support for those communities and resources to help them form better proposals. If you are a community-based um, uh, organization that wants to, uh, that has an idea for, um, you know, a, a a s electric scooter program that can get people to the uh, to the to the subways, for example. Um, we, we're going to provide resources to help them develop proposals and uh, and interface with government agencies. And so, um, it's a tough problem. Um, there's there's a number of ways we we I think we still need to define how we're going to address it. But in the short term, um, we're, we're providing resources and making it a requirement to to access any public funds that are going to go towards um, these programs. Great. Thanks, Zarai. Uh, Commissioner Monahan? Well, in, in California, uh, by law, we, ha we have a, a group called the Disadvantaged Communities Advisory Group that provides advice to both the Energy Commission and the Public Utilities Commission. So um, we listen carefully to the advice that they give us about how to structure our programs to be attentive to equity. In the program that we, the Energy Commission manages, the Clean Transportation Program, which is the main source of public dollars for the build out of that infrastructure, we also have an advisory committee for, for that project, and that includes a number of community based uh, organizations as well as, as uh, NGOs representing public interest. And so those are, you know, we really um, are listening very carefully to the advice that we get from our stakeholders. And uh, like in New York, we also we also um, score projects more highly where where there is a community interest that is clearly identified as supporting the project. Um, I think this is an area we can always do better, and we're we're trying to do better. Um, and I feel like this is a you know equity is an issue where we must always be really uh, mindful of how we're using public dollars to make sure that this is a transition that benefits everybody and especially disadvantaged and low income communities. And the definition of disadvantaged communities, it, it, for California's definition, includes exposure to harmful pollution. 
uh, as one of the, the categories of risk. And so um, I, I think what we're, we're learning across the country, so what works, we have to learn from each other, uh, other states. So I was actually listening very closely to, to what's going on in New York and what's going on in Colorado, because I think we, we, we have to do better in this arena. It can't just be what I call the arugula eating coastal elite that get to drive Teslas. It has to be a transition that works for everybody. Oh, and I, one, one last thing is, you know, this, uh, this, we need to focus on this medium and heavy duty electrification, after equipment electrification. There's a huge opportunity there. And we're starting to see the auto manufacturers really step up. So there's some pretty cool offerings that we're going to see in the Ford F-150. And they're looking at ways that you can use these electric vehicles to charge your power equipment. And, you know, it's not just for moving the vehicle, but for actually some of the the, uh, the utility functions that these vehicles can provide when they're electric. Uh, Director Liu. Uh, thanks. Yes, we, 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 are, we are excited about the electric F-150 over here, as well as, well, as, well as the plug-in Jeep, which seems like it will be great for the mountains. Um, yeah, I think Brian mentioned earlier in this discussion some of the dynamics related to local control in Colorado, and I wanted to kind of touch on that for a moment because I think the dynamics of how the local and state governments work here you know, ha have some very applicable lessons in terms of how we do sort of bottom-up conversations about you know, what different aspects of transportation mean for the community. Well, in some respects, it, it shifts the dynamic of where the decisions are made you know, such that there are um, nuances that are harder to execute at the state level. But I also think in what we found at CDAD in the last couple of years is that there's a real opportunity because of the focus on local control to leverage the networks at the community level in order to have a more sort of organic bottom-up conversation about every aspect of transportation. So one of the things that we did, and this is a little bit more in the traditional infrastructure space, but I think it's applicable and so worthy of mention that we did you know, when I came to see that two years ago and at the beginning of the governor's term was we sort of inverted our transportation planning process broadly. You know, we said we're going to take a fresh look and we're going to go to every county in the state and have a conversation you know, with each community sort of on their home turf about what they're getting out of their transportation system. And, you know, what this did was it helped us first and foremost to reevaluate the priorities for dollars that we spend on kind of traditional infrastructure. And it resulted in a plan that is you know, in, in some ways more modest than the plans that were designed mostly by the transportation practitioners and engineers before, um, but that, you know, are, are, are more sort of real world in terms of what we're focusing on. So, you know, a lot of sort of state of good repair and fix, fix it first and look, looking at how we just sort of deal with people's day-to-day -day problems in their lives vis-a-vis -vis transportation in terms of where they're trying to go. You know, wh where, where I take this from the perspective of electrification and clean transportation is we've tried to use the lessons that we learned from going through that process to just very dramatically change the way we work with uh, our local partners and communities around everything from tr traditional transportation projects to clean transportation dynamics to you know sort of how those things come together. So you know, to be very specific about an example, you know we now kind of use use the relationships that we built through that process to each time we go through a major um, effort, whether that's building an infrastructure project or working on a regulation that we're engaged in. You know, we try and develop sort of a steering committee that's specific. Um, to that effort. So, for example, we're right now working on developing uh, greenhouse gas pollution standards for infrastructure projects that will you know, relate very closely to the work that we do around integrating clean transportation technology. And we've tried to kind of pull the best minds from across the state. You know, the, those who are more likely to sort of come at it with an electrification focus and those who aren't, to try and just kind of hash out in very concrete terms. Um, what, what it will mean to develop this policy in a way that will work and be meaningful. You know, in a similar vein, as we, you know, we're working on a large infrastructure project in the neighborhood that I mentioned earlier, um, that really concentrates a lot of our freight traffic, and we've developed a kind of a kitchen cabinet of community leaders to help us think through how we build that project in a way that you know, includes very significant. Um, clean transportation and community equity features, you know, including uh, li likely thinking through how we work in the infrastructure to support cleaner trucking in that area. So, you know, kind of bro broadly, we think that having these kinds of conversations that are just sort of focused, you know, at every step on having having the players who are impacted at the table kind of forces us to think very differently about community inclusion and equity as we develop transportation uh, projects. 
that's great to hear how comprehensive your efforts have been on that front. Um, so I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I want to address the other uh, big topic of focus uh, these days. Um, we've had a lot of questions about um, how state how states are sort of working through um, transportation electrification policies in light of COVID. And um, what do uh, uh, all of you think about uh, which policies are most impactful given that States are sort of grappling with slashed budgets. They have other priorities to focus on. Um, can each of you talk just a little bit about um, how your states are contending with that? Um, uh, Director Liu, maybe we can just start with you since you're already on screen. Sure. Uh, so uh, obviously for us, as everyone, COVID has presented ch challenges and sort of forks in the road. But I think it's also allowed us to think creatively in ways that are a bit outside the box about you know, topics we probably wouldn't have been able to engage on otherwise. And, you know, I'll, I'll use an example that's a bit tangentially related by way of example, but you know, early in COVID, it became clear that downtown spaces were being you know, utilized in ways that kept businesses open. And we were able to start a program that re really enabled us to work with communities across the state to think about how they could use their sort of city space uh, to keep the economy alive, but also to promote cleaner and more active transportation. And you know, that, that, that kind of thinking has segued us into being able to have different kinds of conversations about you know how we use our space for clean transportation and um, electric charging infrastructure and otherwise. You know, I think in terms of the money specifically, you know, we, we are continuing to sort of charge, charge ahead, no pun intended, in, in, ter in terms of thinking about what we need and developing our roadmap over the past year, which has been an exercise that has gone on through COVID, has allowed us to Sort of chart out where the gaps are. We're doing a gap analysis of where the investment needs lie, and we're actually having a live conversation right now in our as we enter our legislative session about additional funding um, that would that would include uh, electric charging elements among others. You know, I think that we're also optimistic that there might be federal stimulus aimed at this area. And, you know, we, we, we are uh, very firm in our view that if we're looking at shovel-ready projects in the current environment, what, one of the things that that means is building out our electric charging network. So I think we're very, you know, very optimistic that as we get from the kind of confusion and, um, and unexpected circumstances caused by COVID to the conversation about economic recovery, there's a big place for uh, all, all of the Supportive aspects towards electrification in that discussion. Zurai, would you want to take this next? Sure. Um, I mean, it's a tough question. I'd say um, most of the challenges um, presented by COVID and the pandemic um, related to advancing, um, you know, the deployment of EVs or EV infrastructure existed before the pandemic. It merely amplified it in many cases. And so they were um, particularly within the Public Service Commission's um, jurisdiction, you know, um, controlling costs uh, is, is always important. And so, you know, these were constraints that we were operating um, under uh, prior to the pandemic. And it sort of hit at a weird time because we had just made our um, staff proposal uh, January of 2020 um, for the $700 million EV make ready program. Um, and then it was adopted by the commission in July of 2020. And so it all sort of happened right in the middle of us grappling with the pandemic. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, the this is taking public money at a time when, um, you know, budgets um, need to be um, you know, we need to be really diligent with them and we define cost savings. And I just say, um, you know, it, it helps to, to to do the analysis and show that um, for that seven hundred million dollars, we we think we're going to um, unlock about two point six billion dollars of of public benefits. And so we you know spend a lot of time thinking about what do we get for this money and this investment. Um, the benefits include um, costs that are outside of utility rates, um, but we also did an analysis on the rates, and what we discovered was that. Um, you know, uh, the, the revenues that are raised by the additional use of energy um, from EVs um, more than offset what we what we um, are taking in the near term from ratepayers, And so we actually get a net reduction in bills by um, by the program. And then the other piece is when we spend and when, you know, um, if the market isn't quite um, moving as quickly as we think it would um, because of this pandemic, um, you know, is, are we going to invest too much early at a time when it's um, imprudent to do so? And um, we just, you know, puts a lot of care in the design of 
um, the infrastructure um, incentives so that we only um, uh, essentially take money um, and, and withdraw it from ratepayers when the money is spent. And so if it's spent at a slower pace than we anticipated, um, we have some um, some accounting mechanisms to um, make sure that um, <clears throat> there's not a misalignment of the spending um, and the, the raising of revenue from, from rate payers. Um, and so, you know, I think um, wh whether we intended to or not, a lot of, I think, the biggest concerns about the pandemic were addressed in um, our thinking prior to um, us, you know, having to operate under those new uh, under this new world. So, um, you know, I, I guess that's that's my, um, my 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 big picture take on 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 our our, our uh, addressing of that issue. Great, thank you so much, um, and Commissioner Monahan, you have the last word. Well, COVID nineteen, I mean, has impacted us so profoundly in so many different ways. Uh, interestingly, though, in the California market, so. Vehicle sales are down overall, but electric vehicle sales as a percentage of the new vehicle sales are higher than they've ever been, higher than they were last year or the year before. Uh, and we're seeing this play out not just in California, but globally. So EV sales in the EU are higher than they've ever been. You know, China is definitely a major uh, market, the biggest market in the world for electric vehicles. And what we're seeing is that these vehicles are going to be cheaper in the next two to five years, according to good analysts. These vehicles are going to be cheaper than their internal combustion counterpart to buy, let alone on the life cycle. So, you know, what we're seeing is that this is an inevitable movement to electrify transportation. The question is how, how fast. And so um, the policies that we have in place, like the low carbon fuel standard, are pretty unique in terms of providing Kind of steady incentives for transportation and electrification. Um, the governor is also proposing to put $1 billion towards charging infrastructure. And as Sarai said, I mean, this is something, if we do it right, it lowers rates for everyone. If we do it right, consumers who buy an electric vehicle will have much less uh, cost overall. If we do it right, that money gets recirculated back to our economy and continues to, to to generate benefit internal, internally in the state. Uh, so we're seeing this as an opportunity for supporting, um, you know, keeping money in consumers' pockets and keeping money in the state of California and not exporting it out to other countries. Great. Um, so unfortunately, it looks like we're approaching the hour mark. And as much as I'd like to keep this conversation going, I'd want to respect everyone's time. So. I want to thank you all so much for participating um, in our webcast today. Uh, we really appreciate the time that you've taken out of your day to help us support the release of this report. I also want to thank all our um, viewers who asked more questions than I knew what to do with. So if there is anything outstanding, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to sort of help answer your outstanding questions. Um, in the meantime, we're hoping to send all attendees a link to this recording in about a day or so. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. And we look forward for, to hearing from you again. Thanks all.